The Lord be with you. Today uh, we're working on Paul's letter to the Colossians, if indeed it is Paul. There are some significant differences, it seems to me, from Paul's normal letters and his usual vocabulary and style of writing. So there is a case to be made that this is a, this is a post-Pauline writing. But um, it says it's from Paul, and that's the way the tradition took it. There's no uh, strong reason in interpretation why it needs to be much later than the time of Paul. It also has significant uh, affinities with Ephesians, and it also seems to have s cited or used ideas from Paul's other letters. So if it's not from Paul, it's from somebody who knew Paul very well. And it's a part of Scripture. It's part of the canon, so it's authoritative for the church, um, and for us uh, as members of Christ's body who read and use these letters. So uh, we're going to say it's from Paul, and he, uh, at the end of chapter 1, said to the Colossians how much he toils and struggles to proclaim and teach and warn uh, the churches that he has founded. Now, he didn't found this one, um, but he uh, cares for it, and he considers it to be in his orbit, uh, in his sphere of responsibility. Uh, and he knows Epaphras from this church who has been helping him. And so he got word that there were troubles, uh, false teaching especially, uh, teaching that he felt he needed to address to this church and to the church at Laodicea and probably also to the nearby Christians in Hierapolis um, who aren't mentioned in this letter, though the Laodiceans are. Uh, and he, he wants to assure all of the churches in the Lycus Valley of his concern for them. And so he says that he toils and struggles to present everyone mature in Christ. And then at the opening of chapter 2, uh, he reaffirms this struggle. Um, as you know, the chapter divisions are artificial. They weren't a part of the original writings of the New Testament. They were added in the Middle Ages. Uh, and there might have been no particular reason to divide um, chapters 1 and 2 at this point, since chapter 1 ends with the words, for this I toil and struggle with all the energy that God powerfully inspires within me. And then he says, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you. So 129 and 2.1 go together very well. And maybe there's no real break there in thought at all. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those in Laodicea nearby. The church at Laodicea is also mentioned in chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3 in the book of Revelation. And for all who have not seen me face to face, there might have been some concern locally on the part of the Colossians and Laodiceans that Paul had not yet visited them and maybe they felt a bit second class. Um, he wants to reassure them that he does love them and care about them prays for them, thinks about them, and a part of his toil and struggle is the writing of these letters uh, to the churches that they might be able to resist the false teaching that has come to them and grow in their relationship with God. So he says uh, that he is uh, working on behalf of all those whom he has not seen face to face and wants their hearts, verse 2, to be encouraged and united in love. The word for encouraged here is the same word uh, base that we have in the Gospel of John for the paraclete. The Holy Spirit is called the paraclete, the comforter, the counselor, the one called to the side, to alongside, to help people. Uh, and that's the same word that's here, that's translated encouragement. I want you to your hearts to be encouraged. And so Paul is an, a paraclete here, isn't he? He is an encourager. He wants them to be encouraged and united in love. Uh, 
love was the most prominent characteristics of the early, most prominent characteristic of the early Christians. Uh, it was remarked how they love each other, care about each other. Love was not a primary value in the Roman world. There were other primary values of honor uh, and shame and courage uh, and fortitude and so forth that were common Roman values, uh, valor. Uh, but for Christians, uh, the first fruit of the Spirit in their lives was love. Uh, and the greatest, as you know, as Paul wrote, the greatest of all these is love. And he wants them to be encouraged and united in love for one another so that by this encouragement of love and unity, they might have all the riches of assured understanding. I'm using the NRSV today uh, for the talk. So if your translation varies a little uh, in these verses, don't mind that. Uh, these are all good alternate translations. The people who did these professional translations know what they're doing. And sometimes they prefer one word over another. But, uh, but the, the basic meanings are almost always the same, though the vocabulary may differ. Uh, so that you may have all the riches of assured understanding and have knowledge of God's mystery. These words knowledge and understanding were probably words that were being thrown around in the Colossian heresy, emphasizing the superior knowledge, perhaps, of the one who was presenting these uh, arguments uh, that were influencing the Colossians away from Christ. Uh, and so Paul wants to say to them that he wants them to have the riches of assured, certain, safe, um, de dependable understanding and knowledge in of God's mystery. He likes the word musterion, and it was used in the mystery religions. And he wants to tell them that Christ is that mystery. Uh, we've run into this idea earlier that um, he has talked about in verse 27 of chapter 1 this mystery which is Christ among you, or in you, the hope of glory. I actually think it's probably better translated, Christ among you, uh, in your midst, where two or three are gathered together, there is Christ in the midst. Uh, and he wants to assure them, not only that Christ dwells in them, that's certainly true as well, but that Christ is livingly resurrection, living Christ, the resurrected living Christ is present, among them as they gather in his name. And he wants to have, to assure them of that presence of Christ with them, Christ who is the mystery of God, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That is, this new false teaching won't be able to add anything to what they already have, the wisdom which is Christ, the knowledge which is Christ. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. And here the reference is to spiritual wisdom, to theological, um, God-centered wisdom or, or teaching. It's not referring to geography and biology and astronomy and other sciences. Um, that knowledge is not the knowledge he means here. He means the knowledge of spiritual things that draw us deeper uh, into our relationship with God. And so he says, and all the, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. If you have Christ, you have enough. You have all that is needed for the deepest possible relationship with God. I'm saying this, he says in verse 4, so that no one may deceive you with seemingly plausible arguments. Um, the false teaching was giving them reasons uh, based on human understanding, it will later on say, um, for why they should uh, minimize or relativize who Christ was. But here he tells them that he is writing 
so that no one may deceive you with plausible arguments. Um, Paul wishes he were there uh, so that he could be the one uh, answering these plausible arguments. Uh, and I think uh, that comes out in verse 5. He says, though I am absent, unfortunately, we might read into it, though I am absent, unfortunately, in body, yet I am present with you in spirit. Um, this is something that he takes rather realistically. Um, he thinks about them, he prays about them, and he sees himself with the Colossians and the Laodiceans. He sees himself with them as if he were present. Uh, and he wants them to know that that's a realistic presence that, that he, he shares with them. Um, he's with them in spirit. This could be a capital S. The Greek doesn't distinguish capital letters and small letters uh, with a word like spirit. And so this could be, I am with you in the spirit, in the Holy Spirit, not just in my spirit, with your spirit. And I rejoice to see, the NRSV says, your morale, something like good order uh, is meant here. Uh, that he knows from Epaphras that the congregation is actually in good shape and he doesn't want that weakened in any way by the teaching of the Colossian heresy. And so he says, I rejoice to see your morale and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Um, he doesn't think their faith is shaky, but uh, he is not present to help uh, in the refutation of the false teaching. And so he appeals to what he already knows is true about them, and that is the firmness of their faith. And, and by appealing to their love and appealing to their firmness of faith, he reinforces, doesn't he, those qualities. Um, he says, I know your love that unites you with one another, and I know the solidity and firmness and steadfastness of your faith. And when somebody says that to you, you're encouraged to love even better and to be uh, continuing firm and steadfast in, in your faith. Verse 6, a very famous verse uh, in my history. Um, I, had, I was part of a scripture memory program when I was a kid, uh, especially in elementary school, but even later in high school and college, um, I... Uh, had memory cards that were published by the Navigators. And that organization still exists. I think it's uh, headquartered in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, and they have a scripture memory program that uh, I participated in. And you got packs of memory cards. And, and you were encouraged to memorize the scripture and the, all the verses were verses that would help you most in your own Christian life. And verse 6 of chapter 2 was one of those. Um, and back then we were memorizing in either the King James Version uh, or the old RSV. And I think most of my memory work was in the RSV. But verse 6 was one of those verses that uh, it was thought to be uh, very helpful to us in our relationship with God and it would help us grow and be strengthened in that relationship. And so verse 6 says in the NRSV, as therefore you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. It could be translated this way, as therefore you have received Christ Jesus as Lord. Uh, either translation is a correct translation of the Greek. Um, the most direct translation is, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord. But the Lordship of Christ, that is his sovereign control of our lives, and implied in that our complete surrender and dedication to our Lord, um, uh, that is, we as servants of the Lord, uh, is implied in that word Lord. So uh, it means the same thing. Uh, if, it, if you translate it as, as you have received Christ the Lord, means the same thing as you have received Christ as your Lord. Um, and he says that this is true of the Colossians. He's not doubting that. 
he knows they have received Christ as their Savior and as their Lord. And so if he is their Lord, then they should continue in him, continuing to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So keep on walking uh, is actually literally what the word says. Keep on walking in the Lord. Uh, we talk about your daily walk or your Christian walk. It's a metaphorical way of referring to our uh, going forward in the Christian life, making progress and growth in Christ. And so he says, since Christ is your Lord, continue to live in him, in this close relationship with him, rooted in him, uh, so that uh, this agricultural metaphor um, is a metaphor that says that our life is to be grounded, grounded in Christ. Uh, that's where it will receive the nourishment that it needs, if it's rooted in Christ. And then he switches metaphors um, to a, to a architectural one and that he uses in Ephesians 2 and says that we are to be built up like a structure with Christ as the chief cornerstone. We are to be built up in Christ. So rooted, built up, established, um, a kind of legal term for a firm uh, legal foundation. But um, all of these words, uh, these, three, uh, these three expressions of rooted, built up, and established, all point to the firmness and steadiness of their faith. Uh, he doesn't want them to be shaken or drawn away uh, by the Colossian heresy, but uh, to be continually rooted and built up in Christ and established as they were taught from the beginning. Um, there was instruction that was involved in becoming a Christian. Uh, there was pre-baptismal instruction by the late first century uh, that candidates for baptism uh, were instructed in the basics of the Christian faith, the ABCs of the Christian faith, uh, things that we might call the first things or the foundational things. Uh, and he says, you were taught these things uh, in your pre-baptismal instruction. Um, he wants them to remember the things that uh, established their relationship with God, faith in Christ, uh, faith in his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, um, the truth of what God had done in Christ to bring us into a right relationship with God. Um, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, he says, are in Christ. But he wants them this to be done with a, a spirit of thanksgiving, not of, um, not of ang anxiety or of restlessness, or of, um, it occurs to me, he's contrasting this thanksgiving with someone who might uh, take his Christian life so seriously that he would forget to be thankful. Um, there are problems that face the Colossians and that face us, um, but most of them can be tempered by gratitude, tempered by thanksgiving. Um, we were, as uh, young people and adults in the church I grew up in, uh, urged frequently to count our blessings, uh, to name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done as the song went. Uh, and Paul wants the Colossians to have that spirit of thanksgiving uh, in all things, as he says in Philippians uh, in chapter 4, uh, giving thanks in all things. Starting in verse 8, he takes on the Colossian heresy directly. Uh, he's alluded to it with these words like treasures of wisdom and knowledge and false arguments and so forth. Um, but now he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. So let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, he's concerned 
that whoever is espousing and pushing this false teaching in Colossae, uh, whether it's an outsider, as I think is likely, or someone inside who's been drawn away to some other point of view, uh, some wisdom, as it were, uh, from the world that they're trying to bring into the basic Christian faith of the Colossians. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive. Um, it's not that philosophy itself is wrong. Uh, he's concerned about the wrong kind of philosophy, but he's also mainly concerned about their being taken captive by that philosophy he wants them to be captive of Christ. That's why at the end of the verse he says, and not according to Christ. I want you to be captive according to Christ. That is to let Christ be your Lord as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord. So walk in him, continue in him. He wants them to be captive of Christ and to be captive of no other. Uh, Jesus said you can only serve one master. Uh, and not two masters, and he doesn't want their, their, Lord, their servanthood to be divided between a philosophy presented by a false teacher, which has a certain kind of wisdom to it, uh, but it, he says it's a human tradition, a tradition according to human beings, human thinking, not divine teaching. Uh, that divine teaching was presented to them uh, as they prepared for baptism. He doesn't want this human tradition to intervene and to undermine and draw them away. Uh, he also says that uh, he's worried that they will be taken captive according to the elemental spirits of the universe. Now, this is, as you know from your commentary, and I would refer you back to more detail in your commentary, uh, there's more than one way to translate that word stoicheia. Here, I agree with the NRSV translation of elemental spirits of the universe. That is spiritual powers. Remember in Romans, Paul says that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God neither life, nor death, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. It's these principalities and powers that he has in mind here when he talks about the elemental spirits of the universe. Uh, people were appealing to spiritual powers that they thought were a part of creation. Uh, and and teaching other people what they thought these elemental spirits were insisting on. And he does not want the Colossians to be to fall for this, uh, this, this false philosophy that is undermining their Christian faith. He does want them to be taken captive of Christ. We belong to him. He is the Lord and we are his servants in all things, at all times, and in all places. All that we are and have is, is the Lord's for his using. So may he help us to live for his glory and in his service as faithful stewards, thankful stewards of all the gifts that, that God has entrusted to us. For And the reason they should not be taken captive by this false philosophy is that in Christ, all the fullness of God dwells bodily. That is, there's nothing else needed. All the fullness of God dwells in Christ. The whole fullness, the whole pleroma, a technical term uh, in early Gnosticism to refer to the divine realm. Uh, and Paul says all that is in that divine realm, all the wisdom and knowledge and understanding that's in that divine realm resides bodily in Christ. The reference to bodily may also be an anti-Gnostic um, expression because many of the Gnostics and the Docetists who preceded the Gnostics thought that Christ was basically a spirit and, would, and was not fully human. Uh, and so the letters of John uh, and Paul emphasize the 
humanity, the embodied fullness of God in Christ, fully God and yet fully human as well, so that he can identify with us in all that we go through in our lives to know that Christ is fully human as well as fully divine. So they don't need to be taken captive by any other philosophy or point of view. For in Christ you already have the fullness of God and you yourselves have already come to fullness in him. That is, you have everything you need in Christ. You have everything you need. You don't need to add any other philosophy to that. You have come to fullness in him. He is the head of every one of these principalities and powers. They were all, as we learned in first, the first chapter, verses 15 through 20, that he created them all and he is the head of everything. He is the head of every ruler and authority. So that I think we'll stop there uh, for today. We could get on to verses 11 and following, but it it would take us more than 30 minutes to, to finish uh, the rest of this uh, chapter. So I'm going to stop here at verse 10. But the emphasis has been on the sufficiency of Christ. If chapter 1 was about the preeminence of Christ, this part of chapter 2 is on the all-sufficiency of Christ for the Colossians and for us. Thanks be to God.